Hi there, and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar, 3-axis and 6-axis introduction and primer. My name is Nikki Chris. I'm the marketing manager here at Interface, and I'll be your hostess for today's webinar. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A chat field, and we'll be sure to address them during our Q&A after the initial presentation. Any technical questions regarding the GoToWebinar platform are also welcomed, and I will answer them via the live chat function to the best of my abilities. We are recording today's webinar, and a link will be emailed to all those who registered, as well as additional materials, including the slides. A short survey on the 10 questions should appear at the end of the event, and will also be emailed to the all in attendance. Our presenter today is Interface Product Manager, Keith Skidmore. Keith has been with Interface for almost two decades and is the resident expert on all things torque, instrumentation, and multi-axis. He studied mechanical engineering at The Ohio State University. Keith loves to barbecue and is somewhat of a brisket connoisseur. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Keith Skidmore, and you all have a great day. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar Wednesday. My name is Keith Skidmore. As Nikki pointed out, we're we'll talking about uh, multi-axis sensors today. You can see the agenda. I'm actually going to start with a little, a uh, little bit on single and two-axis sensors, and that'll move into three-axis and six-axis. And then we have some applications to review, some basically sample applications of three-axis and six-axis sensors, and then the Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. Um, so, I'm sure everybody knows what a single axis sensor is, but basically a single axis sensor measures a single force or torque. And a single axis sensor will have a, a force axis or a torque axis. And basically the idea would be to apply all of the loads through that axis and try to minimize or prevent any extraneous loading. So, single axis sensor measuring a single axis load. Benefits of using single axis load cells is typically you get your most accuracy from a single axis sensor. So if you look through specifications, the specifications of a single axis sensor will typically be the tightest of any type of uh, sensor when you start to look at uh, single versus multi-axis sensors. Um, limitations, of course, are that it only measures in one axis. So a lot of times you may want to measure more than one axis. So that brings us to the single axis, I'm sorry, to the two axis sensor. And many cases, a customer may want to measure either two forces or two torques or a force and a torque or any two loads simultaneously. Um, in many cases, it can be done using two sensors. So when you talk about multi-axis measurements, in some cases, you can use multiple sensors. Um, benefits of that is you may be able to get the sensors off the shelf. They may be less expensive, and you can typically use the most uh, accurate sensors. The limitations, though, are always going to be in the uh, fixturing and installation, it can get quite complicated to actually mount two sensors into one uh, uh, system. And for example, here I show a single axis load cell and a single axis torque sensor. You can imagine you could stack these two on top of each other. You'd have to make some adapter plates to make them fit together. And then as you applied your torque, you could measure torque using the torque sensor. As you applied a thrust or a tension load, you could measure it with the load cell. The problem is as you twist the torque sensor, you're going to um, be applying torque to the load cell as well and vice versa. So these have to be sized appropriately so you don't overload one with the uh, load of the other. Um, the alternative would be to protect one from the other, say using a bearing setup. Um, that is less than ideal because you actually get uh, quite effect on the measurement from the bearing. So in, in principle, this is possible. In reality, it becomes somewhat challenging to sort out the fixturing and to get a good measurement. So that brings us to actual two-axis sensors. This is an example of an axial torsion sensor, which actually measures thrust in the z-axis and then torque or moment about that same z-axis. You can see this sensor has been specially designed so that you can actually apply a torque to it, so it has a bolt flange, and then that flange is actually bolted to the sensor, which allows the torque to be applied into the sensor without slipping. And that's another point. If you have a threaded, say, single center thread, as you apply a torque, you might start to get some twisting of the fixturing. So something like this axial torsion sensor takes into account all of the fixturing requirements 
and greatly simplifies the installation. Um, limitations of these types of sensors is typically there's a fixed ratio. And so in any given model, it'll have a capacity in torque and will also have a capacity in force. And as you go up in force, the capacity and torque goes up as well, and they kind of go in lockstep together. And so in some cases, you might want to measure, say, a very high force and a very low torque. You do have to size the sensor for the, uh, to withstand the greater of the two. Um, that's always the case, though. Um, so that brings us to three-axis sensor. So a three-axis sensor basically combines all three forces into one sensor and it's measuring force in the x, y, and z axes, and they are perpendicular to each other. Um, benefits of this would be a, a compact design. You can imagine if you tried to mount three single sensors into a system, it would start to get pretty cumbersome. So this sensor allows you to measure all three axes in a small compact design. Limitations, same as with the uh, two axis axial torsion is the uh, capacities in each axis are typically fixed. So as you go up in the z-axis, you also go up in the x and y-axis as well. Um, here's a couple examples of three-axis sensor designs. Um, this one on the left is um, conceptually easy to understand. It's essentially three single-axis load cells that are mounted end to end. You can see where my mouse pointer is. This would be the z-axis measurement with the strain gauges mounted on the uh, flexing element. This could be the X measurement, and then this would be the Y measurement. So the load is applied here, and on the bottom, as you apply the loads, you know all of these three sensors may flex and give you an output. Um, a little better design would be something like this, which shows a three-axis sensor that's more symmetric as it's loaded. So in this case, as you load the Z-axis, these other sensors may twist a little bit, and so you get some non-symmetry in the uh, load path. Um, in this design, we have a z-axis sensor that's bolted into an xy frame. So you can see the z-axis sensor could act as a uh, single z-axis sensor. It happens to be mounted into this frame. The frame flexes at its edges and provides um, your x and your y output measurements. Now, one of the nice things about a three-axis sensor is that you don't actually have to use all three axes since this is a... A uh, full Wheatstone bridge on each of the three axes, they're entirely independent. And so it, in some cases, you might just want to measure, say, Z and X. Perfectly possible. You just ignore the, uh, the third channel. And that brings us to six-axis sensors. And the fact that if you only want five axis or, or four axis, you still need to use a six-axis sensor. And you may or may not actually care about all of the six axes. But it brings you to the six-axis sensor, which is a sensor that measures all three forces simultaneously with all three torques about those same force axes. Again, the benefits of this type of sensor is it's a much more compact design than trying to accomplish the same thing with a bunch of uh, single-axis sensors. Um, so it makes the installation quite simplified and reduces the engineering required. Um, limitations, again, are fixed capacities in each axis, typically, and so as you go up in one axis in capacity, the other axes follow as well. Um, the six-axis is an entirely different beast than the other multi-axis sensors in that it has six channels. Um, none of those channels are specific to any given axis, so in each load case, you need to measure all six channels and then the actual loads are calculated from those channels. So you can see it's over, greatly simplified, but this basically looks like a six-legged stool. You imagine there's a full Wheatstone bridge on each leg, and then if you were to sit on the stool or apply a, a Z-load onto that stool, all six Wheatstone bridges would uh, feel the strain, and you would end up with output on all six channels. You can imagine if you just said, oh, I'll just look at channel six. Well, that doesn't tell you what's happening. And so it's a misconception. In many cases, these sensors, the customer um, really wants to associate a channel with an axis, but you have to kind of forget about that way of thinking and understand that in the six-axis sensor, you have to um, look at all six channels. And the next slide, we can talk about how that works.
works. It's basically a cross product between all six outputs and a coefficient matrix. The coefficient matrix is a six row, six column matrix that has um, coefficients in it and there's an equation where you can calculate the load in each axis and I have a couple examples here. Um, fx would be equal to channel 1 times coefficient 1 plus channel 2 times coefficient 2 and so on all the way across the top row all the way through coefficient 6. And Fy follows the exact same equation except you now multiply all of the channel outputs second row in the matrix. So now it's channel 1 times coefficient 7 all the way through channel 6 times coefficient 12 and then FCMX etc so on and so forth um, and these have to be calculated each time the load changes and so you have to calculate the loads for these equations with each uh, taken. Um, there's also a calculation then that can translate the calculated moments from the measurement origin to the point of application. You can you imagine in certain applications the force is may be applied somewhat off the uh, origin of the sensor. And the origin is always defined on the calibration certificate, typically at the top surface. So your X, Y, Z origin may be, say, at the top surface of the sensor, but you may have a fixture and the actual loads are applied six inches off the top of the sensor. But you don't really care necessarily what the moments are at the sensor. You want to know what the moments are at your test specimen. So you have to translate the calculated moments over to the new origin and there's a second set of equations that allows that. Um, some of that sounds rather complicated. Um, it's easily done in software. Um, to facilitate this we actually have a, an amplifier that we recommend. It's called our model BSC-8 and this takes six channels of um, millivolt per volt data in and then it outputs that data into a software package that calculates the loads, calculates the translation of the moments, it logs and graphs and stores everything to file. So quite handy, it prevents uh, or eliminates the need to do all of the math um, in your own system. Although the math isn't so hard if you do some post-processing on the data after data collection. Um, we can talk about this more if anybody's interested and we can demonstrate the software at a later date. Um, so, now that we understand the difference between all of these different multi-ax sensors, I'd like to talk a little bit about applications. Uh, first, we're going to talk about some three-axis applications, then we'll move on to some six-axis applications. So, for the three-axis application, the first one we talk about is cutting force. And there's a lot of work being done to characterize and understand cutting force and how it affects the tool life and um, cutting efficiency and various things. So, this is an example where the customer wants to use an ultrasonic cutting tool and they're trying to understand the uh, difference in cutting um, force versus uh, material removal, various parameters. And so what they do is they mount the material that will be cut onto a three-axis load cell and then they perform some uh, cutting with the cutting tool and they can actually measure the reaction of the material as the tool cuts in the material using the three-axis sensor. And basically this can allow them to understand what's happening better and then either refine the uh, cutting parameters or make changes to the um, materials used in the, the cutting bit, various things like that. Um, the, we have an amplifier that pairs quite nicely with these multi-axis sensors. It's called our BSC-4 and it's basically a four-channel amplifier so you get an extra channel but it marries up to a three-channel amp, I'm sorry, to a three-channel load cell. And then the output can either go into a PC or it just amplifies them up into uh, plus or minus 10 volt signals. Um, moving on to the next application, this would be a uh, study that might be done, say, at a university or a, a customer who's trying to understand the friction between two materials. Um, I actually had a customer who was doing this. They uh, set up a linear bearing and they're applying weights on top of a platform and then that platform was applying a load between uh, two different specimens as they uh, dragged the uh, one specimen across the other. And that worked okay. They're using a load cell to pool on the platform and then they're using the weights to generate the downforce. So the problem with that was they're finding it wasn't terribly repeatable and one of the problems was that the bearing was taking up um, some percent of the applied Z weight. 
and also the friction in the bearing that wasn't necessarily uh, constant as it slid it would uh, change characteristics so to improve the setup what they did was they mounted a three axis load cell below the platform and then mounted their test specimen to the sensor and then had that test specimen pressing against the uh, the other uh, specimen and then you imagine as they apply their weights that creates the downforce but they can actually measure the downforce with the sensor and same thing as they uh, move the table around or the platform around they can actually measure the actual force at the specimen as opposed to at the bearings so this worked out quite well and they were able to improve the uh, repeatability of their testing substantially um, next application the wave tank this is interesting there's a lot of work being done on hydrofoils and uh, things like that and what this example shows is a hydrofoil where as a boat moves through the water the uh, hydrofoils actually provide lift and they lift the boat out of the water which reduces the drag and allows the boat to either go faster or have less uh, your more efficiency less fuel consumption and so what the customer did was they mounted a three axis load cell on basically the um, what do we call it, the upright of the hydrofoil plane and then they dragged the boat through the water in a wave tank and you can see as this is set up the uh, hydrofoil creates lift and also it's going to have drag as it's pulled through the water and the idea would be to minimize drag maximize lift so this is done with a three axis sensor measuring the lift axis and the drag axis and ignoring the uh, side to side axis and this sensor again was mounted into a BSC4 amplifier and that amplifier then uh, fed the data into a PC um, now we move on to six axis applications this is kind of a simplified version of what you might find in a wind tunnel there's a six axis load cell with a stock and the stock is then attached to a sample in the wind tunnel which could be a wing or in this place or case is a, a full model of an airplane and you imagine as the wind in the wind tunnel blows across the test specimen lift drag all kinds of various forces are created and those can be measured using a six axis load cell in this application though because of the length of the stock the uh, bending moments into the load cell are quite high. We actually have a specific six axis load cell which is fairly large diameter which allows it to be able to measure quite low forces but also resist and withstand large moments or relatively large moments. And all of these six channels are fed into our, our model BSC-8D amplifier and then the PC calculates all of the loads and logs everything to file. Uh, moving on, ball and socket test. This would be a simplified rendition of what might occur during testing on an artificial joint. Lots of work being done on knee joints, hip joints, uh, you name it. And so what this would do is measure the friction or the uh, the wear characteristic of uh, a ball into a socket. And you can see what we have here is a six-axis load cell, a socket mounted to the top of the load cell, and then have a machine that would apply various loads uh, using a ball into that socket. And then the six-axis load cell allows that uh, full load profile to be measured. And they can either be used to characterize the system. It can also be used to do, say, wear testing. So once the design is uh, developed, you might want to do accelerated testing to simulate uh, you know somebody walking around on their hip for 10 years and so that can be done they can tweak the designs and uh, say a lot of testing like this is going on as we speak and because of that these uh, artificial joints are starting to last a lot longer and be a lot more uh, a lot more happy uh, customers basically so this is a good thing finally this is a pretty interesting six axis application we have a customer who would like to measure um, loads applied to a seat during uh, testing of the seat and sometimes it's durability testing where you basically simulate somebody sitting down and standing up from the seat you know thousands and thousands of times to see that the seat is actually able to uh, hold up over time so what they do is they press a uh, simulated uh, human posterior into the seat and press it release it press it release it um, what they were finding was using a single axis load cell they were getting good measurements, they thought, but they were also ruining the load cells. And so they stepped up in size once to a bigger load cell, 
the bigger load cell also failed, and that's when we started getting involved. And what we think is happening, or thought was happening, was that there was a lot of extraneous loading going on. As you can imagine, as you press the test specimen against the seat, it may actually press, say, at one edge or the other. Then as the seat compresses, that load application point moves around. So in reality, is it's a single axis measurement, but there's a lot of other extraneous loads going on. And sure enough, load cells are overloaded in moments. So the uh, choices were a couple. One would be to just keep oversizing the load cell until it stopped breaking. But that's not necessarily desirable because the load cells were originally uh, selected to have a you know sort of a um, appropriate capacity for the test. So if you multiply the capacity by 100, you start to uh, lose the ability to test what you're trying to test. Uh, another choice would be to put a six-axis sensor in there and actually characterize these extraneous loads, and then make some choices: either redesign the test to minimize the uh, extraneous loading or oversize the load cell or both. And so basically a six axis load cell was mounted into the system and then the tests were ran. And what they could do was measure, uh, excuse me, measure all of the six axis and find that there is quite a bit of moment loading and the moment loading does change at, over time as the seat wears, it changes as the uh, pressure increases and the load application moves around. Um, the moment being changed. And so with that information, then they can go ahead and start to redesign the test, maybe the movement of the uh, of the force application or the orientation of the seat to reduce those moment loads to a uh, acceptable level. And then there's also the option to actually use a six axis sensor in the testing, because in fact, all of these extraneous loads are part of the test. It might be interesting to actually measure them. And then if you were to uh, run a new test on a different seat. If the extraneous loads were significantly different, you'd know that you're really not comparing apples to apples. So very interesting application. That's it for the application notes. And now we're going to move on to the questions segment. OK, so we got one question out there regarding uh, provisions for environmental protection of the multi-axis sensors for cutting fluids, et cetera. Unmuted. All right. Um, they can be protected. They are fully potted, actually, and so they're relatively good. We can also do some further protecting. Uh, we also typically, in a cutting application, request that the customer provide some kind of shielding as well to prevent uh, um, you certainly wouldn't want the load cells soaking in fluid or sitting submerged in the fluid. But it, if it can be shielded, they can definitely be protected against splash. Do you have a through-hole load cell? We have some through-hole load cells, definitely single-axis load cells. We've got quite a few with through-holes. We have through-hole torque sensors, and we have a limited number of through-hole axial torsion sensors. We do not currently have any through hole three axis or through hole six axis sensors, although something like that 6A154 I mentioned has quite a large uh, package with the measuring beams at the external uh, edges, and so it would be possible probably to knock a big hole right through the center of that one. But that would be a custom, so we'd have to talk about that in more detail offline. If you need a 30k pound load cell in Z axis, how can the X and Y axis measure accurately? Well, that's a good question. In, in some cases, it can't. So there's always a compromise. If you have a 30k uh, thrust measurement, your torque uh, axes are typically going to be in, say, the uh, several thousand inch pounds. And so if you're trying to measure 50 inch pounds, it may not uh, work very well. You can also look at multi-axis sensors and note that in some cases, especially the axial torsion sensors, one of the axes may have quite a bit less output at capacity than the other axes. So that's further limiting. If you have uh, only a half millivolt per volt to begin with and you're running at 1% uh, of that capacity, may be challenging. So th these are always a compromise, but the question becomes, is this compromise better than the alternative? In some cases, you say if you have a very high thrust load and a very low torque, it may make sense to try and um, make the measurement using two sensors. But then obviously you have to protect the one from the other and you know deal with friction. Um, in some cases these systems can be set up 
to use uh, flexures, which basically allow the deflection, but they don't have any stiction like a bearing would have. But uh, again, that's very complicated versus using a multi-axis sensor. So again, it's always a compromise. Let's go ahead and address the application that came in via email. Uh, that was the fretting fatigue trebometer. Did I say that right? <laughs> I'll turn it back over to Keith. All right. Yeah, this trebometer question is actually quite interesting. Um, the application note about the friction was kind of a grossly simplified friction test where um, customer here is um, – actually asking about a um, more complicated friction test where the test specimen actually uh, cycles back and forth. Um, and that's um, interesting and it also provides additional challenges. Um, typically you might have quite low um, loads that are trying to be measured, but depending on the uh, configuration, there might be fairly large bending moments and especially if something say were to wiggle back and forth. If you say it's taking a, a test probe and uh, sliding it across a surface back and forth at say 10 hertz, something like that. You actually have a cyclical bending moment into the sensor. So what happens is you might take, um, say it's a 10 newton measurement or a 50 newton measurement. You say, okay, I'm going to use a 50 newton load cell. And then you wiggle around, you know, thousands and thousands of times during a test and it breaks, it overloads. So um, the challenge is to size the sensor appropriately so it can withstand the cyclic loading and also measure accurately. And in some cases, in these three axis sensors, if there's overlap in capacities, typically the bigger capacity, or I should say the physically bigger sensor, will do a better job of withstanding the bending moment. So in the case of a 50 Newton, you could use our, say, 3A60 50 Newton, or you could use a 3A120 50 Newton. And the 120 is going to offer um, quite a bit higher capability of withstanding the bending moments. Um, on the other hand, it's physically larger, so sometimes that's a limitation on whether or not it'll fit into the system. Um, so I'd like to talk more about this application offline, but it's definitely doable, but we'll have to look at the entire combined loading, um, make sure it's not going to wear the load cell out prematurely. Any more questions? Uh, last call for questions here before we wrap up. We're a little early. It's only 10.28, so uh, we've got two more minutes if anybody's got a good question. Otherwise, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Oh, we got, we got another question. So we want to know what the typical delivery on one of our three-axis or six-axis load cells is. We have some of the three-axis sensors in stock. We're trying to stock the units that... Uh, are more popular. Uh, six axis typically are longer, although we do have a, a few of those in stock as well. Um, if something isn't in stock, it ranges from say three to five weeks on the low end to six or eight on the sort of the more typical delivery and then maybe 10 to 12 on something that's uh, built from scratch and maybe something uh, special about it. So again, if everybody has any suggestions on what they'd like us to stock, we'd be glad to entertain that. Great. Once again, thanks everybody for joining us today. And if you have any more questions, uh, send us an email to contact at interfaceforce.com 